Hello and welcome to an event brought to you from the painting course at Camberwell College of Arts. This is the third of our series of British Art Network events exploring the work of British South Asian artists. My name is Ratri Patel and I am jointly leading this research group, British South Asian Visual Art Post Call Britannia. Our previous two talks and discussions have been recorded and, transcri and transcribed and are now up online on the Campbell Hall College of Arts YouTube channel and the British Art Network website. Our first event was titled The Body, uh, the Home of Unseen Landscapes and looked at the placement of the diasporic body within the traditions of Western European art. Our second event, Unswamping the River, Painters Turning the Tide on Racism, looked at how artists have been impacted by and have responded to the fluctuating social polit political position of race in Britain. This evening's event will follow a similar format to those discussions. We have invited three contemporary artists whose, whose work looks at the language of abstraction. They will share their work with us and reflect upon how the visual languages reflect upon their South Asian heritage. I introduce today, today's theme of abstraction and just to let you all know that this talk is being recorded, the event is being recorded, and if you would like live captions, you can press the CC button, which is at the bottom of the screen. I will now hand over to my colleague Daniel Sturgis. Thank, thanks, Raksha. Um, so the theme of uh, t t this evening's uh, conversation is um, abstraction and abstract painting uh, and abstract art in general is not often thought about when discussing race, cultural identity and heritage. More usually it's figurative painting and narrative works of art that we see directly speaking to these issues. But in a way that might miss a lot and the three artists who will be presenting tonight, Rana Begum, Reza Ben-Gadra and Haroon Hayward, have all spoken in the past about how their artworks, their abstract vocabularies, reflect on aspects of their position as British South Asian artists and on the histories of art that their work draws upon. Histories that, of course, may include both aspects of Western and South Asian and uh, uh, Western and South Asian modernisms as well as specific longer traditions in both South Asian and Western art. The realm of abstraction or of working non-figuratively and without a narrative may of course just be an illusion or it may be uh, an impossibility or it may offer a universalism or it may be that the artists just refer to these past positions as they open up new ways of working. I'm sure many of these ideas will come up in the following presentations and each of the artists is very happy to take questions and what we'll do is we'll gather the questions together for after each of the presentations and then um, ask them at the very end. There's a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Uh, the first uh, of the presentations will be by Haroon Hayward. Haroon is a London-based artist who works principally with oil, oil stick and oil pastels, um, and his influences are very diverse and include the cultural politics of 90s dance music, graffiti, graffiti African and South Asian textiles, and even early Mughal miniatures. In his work, we can see an amalgamation of several different and disparate strands of thought converging in one place. Haroon's Solo exhibitions include Too, Too Nice Play It Twice at Indigo Madder in London in 2021, Dance Mania at the Wellington Club in London in 2020, uh, 2020, and group exhibitions that include one at Paradise Road Projects at the moment, and also Aora and the Drawing Room Biennale in London all this year, and other exhibitions include Interference at Rivington Rooms and Gadfly, Indigo uh, and Gadfly at Indigo Madder, both in London in 2019, and while supplies last at Mount Analog, Seattle, America, 2019. So I'm going to pass you over now to Haroon. Hi, Daniel and Raksha. Thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this. 
So I'm going to talk about um, an overriding theme in my practice generally for the last two or three years, and then a show that I put on at the beginning of this year, and how the work from that show has led to what I'm doing right at the moment. So for some time, I've been interested in pattern and repetition with variation in the visual, uh, mostly from textiles, mostly from Indo-Persian and West African, and how that relates to pattern and repetition with variation in the oral, mostly from Detroit Techno and Acid House from the late 80s and early 90s. The show I put on at the beginning of the year is called Two Nice Play It Twice, which is a sort of tongue-in-cheek thing that pirate radio DJs used to say when I was a kid before they would wheel up or rewind the tune and play it again. And it also has a double meaning that refers to the actual work in the show and the way it was presented, which is that everything has a companion piece or a sibling, or the individual pieces that don't have something repeated within them. So there's sort of repetition and repetition and repetition, which is uh, often how a lot of electronic music is actually made. You know, things that repeat, 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 and then you variate. There's variation with that repetition. This is a piece called Night Drive, sorry, Cosmic Egg slash Night Drive Through Babylon, parenthesis gray. Uh, cosmic Egg is a thing that sort of ancient mythology relates to kind of a world, a world, um, origin myth. Night Drive Through Babylon is a quite famous techno tune by Immortal 500. And the blue refers to the headless beast in the bottom right hand corner. So the way I do this piece, the way I've done this piece and every other piece you'll see other than my watercolors is I start uh, with a gesso wind panel. I apply the, uh, the, the first layer, which is the light blue to the panel first. When that's dry, um, I apply another layer of oil paint on top of that and then I will scratch that out with the back of a pen or back of a paintbrush or even an etching tool and when it's dry I'll apply the oil pastel point punctuation points of colour on top of that. Now when that's done I will let that part dictate the bottom left part which is the sort of painted flourish part and this is actually my take on a Peter Lanyon landscape but I change them so much the way I do them that you couldn't really identify with that. So it's more of a reference than a source. And the bottom right, the headless beast is taken from an Indian flag from the 1890s, I think. And the top part is essentially what I think of as music made into visual form. The bottom left part, as I said, is my painting flourish. And in the last few years, I really felt myself drawn towards post-war British landscape painting how in that way that we're allowed to as artists is a bit of artistic license and I just I have an affinity with it I grew up with it I'm barely well educated about it and the bottom right part is um my allusion to the embroidery world that I grew up with um with the textile world my mum is a textile collector um and I grew up around a lot of them so the way I'll do the bottom right part which is I think not that common, I haven't had many other people doing it, as I will mash up an oil bar or oil stick um, in a pot, and then I will apply it with a craft knife um, around a drawer. I don't use stencils at all. It's quite painstaking. Um, then I'll tap it all down, so it's relatively flat, and then I will, just before it dries hard, I will score it, so it emulates embroidery. I've tried to use actual embroidery on there before, and something like the light doesn't hit properly. This is a companion or sister piece, also Cosmic Egg, that's Night Drive Through Babylon, parenthesis grey. Uh, both these pieces are 96 by 56 centimetres. This is a piece called Dress Free, um, which is slightly smaller, and the bottom left part is also a take on a piece of Lanyon painting. Uh, I change them so much with the way that I stylize them. You probably wouldn't also find this in any of his work if you look through books of his painting. This is a painting for Paul Nash and Model 500, who is, um, as I said, is a famous techno producer from Detroit. And Paul Nash is a post-war British landscape slash surrealist slash landscape uh, slash um, war artist who I have a huge affinity with. This is his companion piece, which is a painting for Paul Nash and Kevin Jordan. What I decided to do with these pieces is um, where my references and sources are 
heart of the work, the fact that I'm looking back to these old artists um, from different eras, because Model 500 and Kevin Saunderson are probably still alive, but they are, their heyday was, was not now, it was in the 90s. Obviously, Paul Nash is long gone. This is a painting for Paul Nash and Marshall Jefferson, who was a, uh, I think, Athen House producer from Chicago also in the 90s. This is a painting for Edward Burrow and a guy called Gerald, who is a British acid house producer. And Edward Burrow is also a landscape painter, sort of from generally the post-war generation. This is a painting for Amor Hemsworth and LSD. Amor Hemsworth is a um, Pakistani British painter who I have a huge affinity with. Stylistically, I'm very interested in his form of abstract expressionist modernism, but also I'm interested in his story called anthropologically, uh, sociology, sociologically, because he came here and then he had um, found it difficult for various reasons as an immigrant, but also to break into the art scene. But also he had a home studio practice as I do. So I felt a particular um, connection with him and his practice. LSD is a um, hardcore producer. Hardcore is a type of British electronic music, which is a sort of precursor to drum and bass and jungle. There's a kind of mixture of acid house and, and what we call consider drum and bass, a bit slower. This is its companion piece, which is a painting for Amor Shemza and Bad Mice, who are also quite seminal British horror producers from the 90s. Uh, the bottom left parts of both of them are, again, takes, uh, rather than straight copies of uh, Peter Lanyon paintings. This is untitled. And this is a much smaller piece, which is, um, uh, I forget, but it's about A4. This is the eponymous piece, Two Nice Play It Twice. Some installation views of the show, Two Nice Play It Twice. You can see how everything's either repeated within the panel or the painting next to it somehow as a reference to repetition and pattern and variation as well. So I did these smaller pieces as almost punctuation points between the paintings. I felt that, I, although I hope there's a lot of levity and, and, and freshness in the work and the presentation itself, it seemed heavy in, in a way that I wanted, but I thought these little moments of um, not as much labor were quite important. And now I want to take a moment from this piece uh, which leads on to the rest of what I'm doing to talk about joy. And I mean, joy the emotion, but also my friend's uh, album called Joy that I was uh, invited to make the a cover art for. And we grew up together in Haringey and he now makes, uh, he's one half of quite a well-known house music production duo called Dusky. And in a nice bit of circularity, we found we were at a place in our career that we could finally work together in quite a real way. And he sent me these, um, me the tracks and I went for a long run listening to them and I really just saw that shape out of the ether and I think as a younger man I would have um, been far more maybe too analytical and, and not allowed that sort of third eye ether it's just inspiration to come to me and then just produce it I would have tried to make um, a bunch of different versions and I did but it turned out that the first one I saw and then made was the one that we used which is the bottom one and when we were talking about our practices generally and where we are in life, we're talking a lot about joy. And I said to Nikki that the, having a bit of time out of my career and coming back to it recently, uh, well, three or four years ago, I um, would never have had the confidence to say this as a younger man, as a younger artist, but now it was just, just how it is, is that I feel I want to kind of wake up. I want to have a life with my work as I try to make it my life again. And I want to feel happy uh, and, 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 and not in an inane kind of hippy dippy way, not every day because work is work and especially with, with visual art or with all art, I suppose. Um, it's not that everything you do is fantastic and you feel great about it. In fact, a lot of the time I don't, but my, my general feeling towards my life right now is it's good and, and I enjoy what I'm doing. Although of course, individual pieces don't always work, but generally I, I feel joy in the sense of what I'm making and my life around art again. 
And I want you to be able to walk into a space that I've created or made or, or in front of a piece that I've made and feel joy. So it is, it is really as straightforward as that. It's almost like a, a, something a child would say, but I'm kind of embracing that. And simplistic as that may be, it's actually led me to make, I think, much better work than I was making before. And so it culminated in this um, poster for the, um, for the album and then the album itself, which actually we're going to release um, as a vinyl with nothing on it, which I thought was really bold. It's just going to have that painting on it, no information whatsoever, which I thought was a gamble on their part, but they seem to think that it, um, it will work very well for everyone concerned. These are some watercolors I did very recently at a residency I was on. And I originally, I, I do these quite often, these watercolors, just as small studies that inform my paintings because I had more freedom and time in this, uh, in this um, residency than I normally do in my home. I decided to expand them and make them a bit bigger and I feel they become pieces in their own right. So each watercolor is uh, 56 by 72 centimeters and the top part of each one is a take on a Paul Nash landscape that I have very loosely copied my interpretation and the great thing about watercolor is I'm not I'm not an expert so things happen that I could never have dictated or, or never have imagined and that's quite exciting actually to just allow it to expand into itself when the top parts are done I will then just intuit the bottom parts out of the out I'll just sort of freestyle them and I feel they work quite well this is called untitled parenthesis bird garden this is untitled parenthesis, landscape of the megaliths. This is untitled Whittenham clumps. And this is untitled landscape of the vernal equinox. And this is the one that's informed some work that I'm doing, that I've just presented at the moment. This is painted love, parenthesis, landscape of the vernal equinox. Tainted Love is a tune by Soft Cell, as an electronic tune from, I think, the late 80s, early 90s. But it was also a, um, I think it's originally a Motown tune. And then the Soft Cell tune, I have about five different remixes of different Acid House producers. So I like the fact that it related to pattern and repetition and variation, but in the music world and remixing and refixing of things. Obviously, as you can see, the bottom left part is um, the watercolor that's informed that, the landscape of the vernal equinox by Paul Nash. And the bottom right part is a detail I've again made in um, out of oil bar that's meant to emulate embroidery from an Uzbeki textile called a Susini. I'll turn you a close up here just so you can see the, um, the scoring a little bit clearly more clearly this is its companion piece which is also painted love and in front of this entrance to a lane which is a graham sutherland painting that i've uh, taken inspiration from from the bottom left part and again the bottom right part is a susini is a detail from a susini but in different colors this is night drive through babylon Parenthesis, sun setting between hills. As you can see, I've not only reused imagery to relate to pattern repetition, but also titles. And then you can just change the parenthesis or elements of the title that refer to things being repeated again. Uh, the bottom right is also part of um, a Susini, but just with different colors. This is a painting for Graham Sutherland and Frankie Knuckles. And this is my most recent piece, which is a painting, oh, sorry, it's Your Love, parenthesis, he in estuary. Your Love is a Frankie Knuckles tune, as it has tuned from the mid nineties and tree in estuary is uh, my take on a Graham Sutherland painting of the same name. And the bottom right flowers are from an Indian shawl, I think from the Victorian Indian shawl. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Harun. That was wonderful. Just so interesting to hear 
about all the different references um, um, that you make in your work from um, and different time periods. It's just so fascinating to um, hear about. So th thank you. Um, thank you. Next, we turn to Reza Ben Gajra. Uh, Reza's recent paintings use color and form to focus on the Islamic concept of fitra, the primordial innate disposition that all humans are born upon as taught in the Quran. His work brings together a variety of diverse historical interests, such as modernist Western abstraction, Islamic geometry, Persian miniatures, and art from pre-civilizations. His recent, his, his solo or two persons exhibitions include the showroom, London in 1989, when two means kiss Long and Ryle in 1990, Jerusalem um, Alternative Arts in 91, Rochester Art Gallery in 2011. His work was recently included in group exhibitions um, such as at, at the Bath School of Art, um, alumni show in 2020 and the fantasy of having a trailer wagon all to myself at gallery 46 in 2021 so over to you reza thank you thank you raksha uh, firstly um yeah thank you raksha and dan for inviting me to take part in this project it's an honor to be sharing this platform with harun and rana uh, i should be saying i've I'm, I'm reading from a script, so excuse me if it sounds stilted. Um, so I've been a practicing Muslim for nearly 30 years. Before that, I'll describe my worldview as materialistic, possibly even atheistic. Generally, it's accepted that figurative art, that is depiction of people and animals, is prohibited in Islam. But my reason for abandoning figuration was, at least at first, not through doctrine or dogma, but through a long evolutionary pr process of trial and error. To start with, I thought I'd show a couple of recent paintings and then the journey that got me here. I want to focus on two major, ma uh, two major turning points. Uh, one was my first year at Bath Academy of Art, where I did my BA, and also a year I spent um, in India on a British Council scholarship. Let's um, share my screen. Okay, um, so uh, this painting is called Mifta, which is Arabic for key or opening. My latest work um, typically consists of stripes and concentric set circles. Also, I, I see them as an amalgamation of past works. What underpins it and the work over the past decade, um, as Rapture mentioned earlier on, is the recognition of the beautiful Islamic concept called the Pitra. And just to repeat, um, it means innate disposition, um, and the Quran teaches all, born, all humans are born upon the fitra. And um, it instills in us a yearning to know and worship our creator, Allah, makes sense of purpose and meaning, um, it gives us our moral compass, accounts for rationality and consciousness, and lends credence to the idea of universal beauty, which is what I'm trying to explore in, in these recent, most recent paintings. I'm not trying to make Islamic art as such, um, as much as I love the geometric tessellations and calligraphy and the usual tropes of what we might call Islamic art. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so sign is um, partly inspired by Persian miniatures about the prophet Yusuf, uh, Joseph salam, and Khadija. Um, most of my paintings, most, most recent ones, are painted flatly, uh, but this hints at pictorial space um, and maybe with a reference to miniatures with their seemingly impossible architecture and perspectives. This was made at school um, when I was 17 uh, in my lower sixth at school. Um, at the time, I was committed to being a figurative artist. I was practicing day and night, um, different techniques, and, um, and I, I could only imagine myself being a figurative artist. I, I couldn't imagine any other way until uh, um, I went to uh, Bath Academy in my first year, and that was a first grade challenge for me. Um, we had fantastic, incredible tutors, and um, 
the course was kind of geared to encourage um, the students to adopt a more intellectually rigorous approach uh, rather than just depending on kind of retinal effects and and painting pretty pictures there's nothing there's absolutely nothing wrong with that um, but this was a turning point for me um, i spent a year setting up simple still lives maybe a cup or a bottle the initial idea was about describing form but i started to find drawing and painting from observation problematic when i became increasingly aware of looking with binocular vision, um, blind spots coming into view, um, focusing and defocusing on, on the subject, optical aberrations when, you, you know, if you're concentrating on a, like a cup or something like for a long time and um, the edges of the, of the table, for example, start bending. Um, and there were other reasons as well um, that it became problematic for me, but just for the sake of brevity, uh, I'm, just, I'm just going to stop here. I'll just just pause for a moment. Um, around that time, someone suggested for me to be looking at Jasper Johns, uh, which changed my my way of thinking and looking, and is still a major influence today. At the same time, I'll, I was getting bored with you know painting greys and ochres and cups and bottles. Um, as well as Jasper Johns, I became influenced by Stephen Buckley, who had a retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art in Oxford. Uh, there was a, a definite shift in my approach, treating the painting as an object rather than a window or a picture. Um, so the surface itself became the reality. So moving on to Chelsea School of Art, um, where I did my MA. So I continued with the idea of paintings as objects. So the smearing of red wax um, is not to create pictorial space, but to separate the ground and bring attention to the surface. So I was working quite a lot on um, different panels um, and a lot of them refer to the body as well. Around this time, um, I was looking at a lot of um, contemporary art because you know, I was in London again and just having free access to galleries and museums. Um, and so a lot of new artists or artists I hadn't previously heard of has started coming into view and into, onto my radar. Um, at the time I was looking at the work of um, Daruba Mystery, um, Anish Kapoor, um, Yanis Cornelis. Initially I was using gold leaf as a, a almost like a kind of layer of skin. Um, I mean so it's a really bad photo so excuse me, um, taking from a 35 mil slide. But anyway there are, sli there are slashes in the canvas, um, some stitched. At the time I didn't see it as a religious painting necessarily it's based on kind of mythologies and such like but now i can't help but be, but be reminded of the story of Dalton thomas inspecting christ's gaping wound um i met anish kapoor at my ma show this is taken from my, my ma show and he said to me go and see some real art don't travel you know go east young man um, and i think that kind of planted a seed in me i hadn't really thought about travel i hadn't really thought about um leaving old blighty I hadn't even been on a plane at that point. Um, so this is called A Stars and Gold, and it's made using molten wax. So over the next couple of years, over these two years, uh, I was working very, very quickly and prolifically producing one, sometimes two or three paintings a day, still concerned with the idea of surface, although the work started opening up, you know, sometimes like windows to another world, you could say. Um, at the time, I was influenced by Alan Davy and tantric art. And obviously, you, know, you can see hints of something Indian happening. <laughs> um, and suddenly, around that time, I, was, I started in a very short space of time selling and exhibiting. I was receiving a lot of attention and publicity, which was you know, really good fun at the time. But later on, you know, I, I suffered from burnout, yeah, probably from overexposure, at, you know, at having so much exposure at that early age, uh, early stage in my career. And I'll, I'll pick on that later on. Uh, around that time, I'll, uh, um, I won a scholarship to Baroda University in India to study under the tutelage of Professor Ghulam, I should say the legendary, the great uh, Professor Ghulam Muhammad Sheikh. Um, around that time for a whole year, 
again, you know, very prolific and um, the work kept changing. It was from painting to painting. One, one day is art group, one day is figurative. Um, and Professor Shape um, advised me to choose a path and to stick to it. He said it would be a painful process, but it's something um, that I would need to do. At the time, um, I, <laughs> I assumed he was, all these years, in fact, I, I assumed he was talking about the work. But just over the last couple of days, I've been thinking about it. And I, and I do wonder if he actually meant me as a person, um, because I, I used to be uh, quite hyper and um, very brash very sweary, <laughs> um, and I, I don't know, I, you know, who knows. Um, let me just, um, excuse me. But I just kind of dismissed his, um, his advice anyway, um, in my arrogance, um, but, but actually he was right, you know, I'll find that out take later on, <laughs> you know, hard lesson in life. Um, and so I re returned to Blighty, extremely confused. All my values had been kind of thrown up in the air. I was exhausted. I was out of sync with all my friends and artistically all over the place. Now these, this quite interesting. I just showed, you know, I showed these four paintings. Um, they all paint, painted around the same time. Um, and they're pretty much on the same subject. They're, they're like self-portraits, four different types of self-portraits. So one day, one day I was Frank Stella, one day I was um, Cecil Collins, one day I was Alan Davy or whoever, I think Pink. Um, and um, at the time, so, you know, someone, a friend who kept visiting me up at my studio, you know, thought that the, the work I was doing was like a critique of art history um, and um, that I was mocking art history. And I said, <laughs> But actually, I was actually being very, very sincere with each piece. You know, I was, I was kind of committing myself very, very fully, you know, to, to the project. Um, so around this time, uh, someone gave me Herman Hesse's Steppenwolf. Up until then, I hadn't really been a great reader, but um, I started to absorb quite a lot of books and literature. Uh, I was increasingly, I was getting drawn toward books on philosophy and religion and spirituality. Uh, Nietzsche, Wittgenstein. I also read the autobiography of, of Malcolm X, uh, which is really, really inspiring. And of course, the Quran. Um, so around that time, just towards the end of this period, I started practicing as a Muslim. Um, I returned to my parents' house for a bit. This is my parents' garden. <laughs> the, prod the prodigal son returns. Up until now, the purpose of my life, you know, from the, the first drawing you saw up until now, then um, my, the whole purpose of my life is being an artist, but it, it wasn't doing any good for me. The work, the work, even this at the time, which I, I really like now looking back, but at the time it just wasn't, you know, the work, <laughs> the, the, the paint was getting more and more solid. I had, you know, I was trying to make, objectify this, this painting and it, you know, I found it quite frustrating. Um, but it kind of lost its magic for me. All, all the kind of colors and everything else just meant, meant nothing. And it lost its sense of purpose and meaning. You know, it's like tumbling into this kind of like, abyss of, of nihilism. You know, I pretty much gave up art for about 10 to 15 years, apart from a few odd pieces and drawings. And it was about 18 years before I painted again. Um, and all, all that work that, had, accumulated over the years, I just chucked away, you know, I skipped most of it. Um, some of it I kept and friends came around and rescued some, it was really nice of them. Um, and moving on to this painting is called Avicenna. And so I was doing some silver point drawings um, and this cut and that led to just me thinking more about paint again, because even the silver point drawings were, were getting kind of painterly in, in a way. Um, so it's around 2011, and it's loosely inspired by Ibn Sina's floating man thought experiment. And so I started to see this as a way forward for me, um, that my art could potentially be like um, visual thought experiments or visual philosophical inquiries. So back to my most recent paintings. Yeah, so this, this is done over the last couple of years. So the work has been 
effectively reduce the stripes and concentric circles, mostly flat, painted flatly, with occasional 3D elements such as spheres, pyramids, cones, or cubes. Again, hinting at something primordial. Um, it could be, you know, it could be Aboriginal. It could be what you know, is usually called outsider art. Um, let's, uh, so this is called between the backbone and the ribs. And again, just very, very simple forms. Um, I've been using a, a really large compass, you know, massive, <laughs> massive compass. Um, and um, just playing around with the idea of, of shapes and forms and introducing the idea of split, splitting, splitting a, a, a circle, for example. Um, Yeah, so sometimes these works can be quite playful. They, they might, I don't know, sometimes I, I, I kind of find them funny as well, but um, maybe neurotic. Um, but I think generally the, the language I'm using, uh, I've adopted over the last couple of years to satisfy all those different aspects of, of like my past work and satisfy all those different parts of me <laughs> that need satisfying, whether it's cerebral, you know, that or, or um, being able to, you know, uh, play around with, with form or colour. And, you know, I, I don't mind changing them. I've got, you know, I, I don't mind risking everything and just changing them completely. Next is um, fountain. Um, so this form was appropriated from diagrams of cosmological phenomena, such as wormholes and black holes, um, inflation theory and so on. Um, recently, someone asked me about this, about um, about op art influences like Bridget Riley, which is no doubt there. Um, but I think this one also a much successful Collins, whose work I, I really love. You know, back back in the early nineties, um, early you know the late eighties, um, and also this one possibly hints at an afterlife. I don't know if we just kept <laughs> talking about these things. Um, but I think effectively that that ends my 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 presentation. So thank you for listening. Really looking forward to questions and answers and discussions afterwards. Thank you. Thanks so much, Reza. That was um, amazing and really wonderful to hear um, the journey of the work and also to reflect a little bit on. Um, on the new paintings and um, not only how they're made, but also the sort of um, languages that they're using. Um, before we, uh, we have one more presentation before we go to the questions and the discussion. Uh, so we now move on to uh, Rana Begum, uh, who, uh, uh, Rana works between the boundaries of painting, sculpture and, ar and architecture. And her practice is informed by the language of minimalist abstraction and draws inspiration from the urban landscape, architecture, design, and geometric patterns uh, th throughout the traditional Islamic art. Light is a, a central medium within her process, creating an experience that is both sensorial and temporal. Rana's recent exhibitions include uh, One as Const in Sweden, Infinite Geometry 2021, and solo exhibition at Kate McGarry in London 2021, and Is This Tomorrow at the Whitechapel Gallery 2019. Uh, she had a solo exhibition at Tate St. Ives in 2018, and was in um, Actions Kettles Yard 2018, Women to Watch Heavy Metal at NW, uh, NMWA in Washington in 2018. Um, and curated geometries at Yorkshire Sculpture Park in 2017. Space like colour at the Sainsbury Centre of Visual Art in Norwich in 2017. Uh, the Space Between at Parasol Unit in 2016 and solo projects at Dhaka Art Summit in Bangladesh in 2014 and 2020. Uh, so now I uh, pass you on to Rana. Hi everyone. Thank you, Daniel and Raksha, for having us on the um, on the talk. I'm going to see. Okay. Um, so I thought I'd um, start off. Uh, actually, this is an image of my studio at Chelsea, 
Um, I came into abstraction through um, through kind of actually at the end of my foundation course at Hertfordshire University. I started off like Reza as a figurative artist, and and I couldn't. I couldn't understand what the fascination was with the figure, but I, you know, I kept I kept doing a lot of um, portraits and figure and a lot of still lives, and then slowly I got to kind of um, draw actually draw quite a lot of architectural spaces, and I found that I was drawing a lot of spaces that was kind of. Um, had light seeping into space so it was this kind of light and dark kind of spaces and the drawings were very kind of Giacometti style using a lot of um, line different thicknesses um, and so forth and I remember one time during my foundation course I was doing um I was doing sculpture and I was doing some welding and one of my sculptor tutors had um, said to kind of follow him to the library, he took me to the library and opened up these books on constructivism and uh, minimalist artist and I was immediately drawn to their work, people like Judd, Sol Lewitt, um, Agnes Martin, Mary Martin, Kenneth Nelson. And I was just really excited when I saw their work. I didn't understand it at all. I had a um, bit of a language barrier. Um, English um, was my second language and I also have dyslexia. So um, I really struggled with reading. Um, but I looked through these books and the more I looked at these artists, the more um, you know, fascinated I was by kind of abstraction and kind of geometry and color. And so I then went back to the studio and looked at my work and started making a list of things that I was interested in. And the minute I made the list, which had um, things like line, geometry, repetition, um, all of those things immediately it became quite obvious and it became very abstract but I knew that it was going to be really difficult to kind of do you know research into all of these things in in one go so I had to kind of think about how I was going to approach it so my initial approach was on um geometry and light and how light affects um, the form. So this is actually, I think it's in the first year at Chelsea and you'll see that I started kind of looking form, but it, also, it just wasn't working at all. Everything became quite muddy and murky. And um, the next image kind of indicates really where I then spent, I think about five, six years just looking at light and form. Um, I was playing around with a lot of materials. I was exploring kind of how the light would change the work throughout the day or throughout the week, throughout the month. Um, I, and I was interested in those kind of subtle changes. Um, the other thing that I, you know, at the time, as a student, I, I didn't have much money either. So I was kind of trying to figure out ways of making work that, um, you know, didn't require a lot of kind of financial support. And actually I used to spend a lot of time in workshops and would use materials that was kind of left behind by other people um, or discarded and, I somehow managed to kind of get through my BA and MA. And um, this is um, an image of uh, my studio after, a few years after the Slade actually. And it was in the second year of Slade that I started looking at color just on its own. Um, I knew that color was something that needed exploring um, in its entirety, it, I, I couldn't um, have anything else kind of interrupt that kind of period of research. Um, 
and it was really difficult it's strange um that i um you know, looking back at it now, how much I struggled with colour and to understand colour as well. Um, so I, you can see in the background kind of uh, vinyls, but below those vinyls, I have like shelves and shelves of like adhesive tapes that I used to collect. And I used these materials as a way to kind of explore colour and its relationship to each other. And for me, I wasn't interested in mixing paint. I wasn't interested in that aspect of color. I was interested in more kind of react, I guess um, something that's more reactive um, and where it created some kind of um, mood or environment, if you like. Um, so I, I then spent a few years uh, um, working with this kind of material I mean technically I had so many issues with this material and it was incredibly frustrating and in fact this image is is where I've applied resin onto the tape to kind of make sure it stays down the adhesive on the tape over a um, period of time kind of doesn't work and so it starts to come off the surface um, so I was looking at kind of techniques or ways to keep the tapes down. And one of the way was to kind of um, pour um, two part resin onto the surface. And there's different types of resin. And this was a resin that didn't generate too much heat. Because the other thing that used to happen was that um, a type of resin that it can generate so much heat that it just lifts the tapes off the surface immediately. Um, but this was an epoxy resin and it was great. And you get this kind of incredibly beautiful lush surfaces and quite reflective surfaces. And that was another aspect of the work that I hadn't um, expected, but it was, a, you know, the reflective surface was a constant reminder for me, the three dimensional space that I was occupying or the painting was occupying and, and this kind of need to kind of come out of the wall. Um, this is an example of one of those works where um, I've used kind of adhesive tapes on aluminium panel and then red poured resin on top. Um, I used to have nightmares to, you know, make sure that I'd get them kind of dust free and not, um, you know, to try and get these kind of perfect surfaces. Um, but this work, I think, um, I produced it till probably about 2006 or seven. Um, you know, this is when I felt quite confident to kind of say, okay, I think I understand color. I can now bring kind of the different aspect of my work or the different as aspect of the research together. Um, and this is where it kind of led to, you know, um, the research kind of led to, it's kind of stemmed off in, in two different direction. One was um, these kind of folded pieces. Uh, these are kind of made of um, now stainless steel, but previously they started off as paper and then mild steel. Um, and they were, for me, um, a study, there were studies to kind of explore color and geometry at the same time. Um, and when I was making them in paper, I got really excited. I loved how light kind of played with them. I loved how some of the surfaces um, reflected light or, or color. And so they've become kind of a body of work that I still um, produced and still get really excited by. Sometime, you know, series of work, um, I'll stop making completely because I feel that I've kind of um, drained them of, you know, of all kind of, um, you know, ideas and exploration, if you like. And, <coughs> um, but this is a, a series of work that I still find really exciting and really interesting. And there's still a lot that I get out of these work. and. Um, yeah, um, this is a body of work that I started initially in 2008 and um, they were, for me, um, studies to explore movement without the work physically moving. Um, I wanted to find a way um, to continue um, 
holding on to the viewer's attention or um, draw the viewer back in again into the work. Um, and I liked this idea that sometimes the viewer can kind of walk past the work and not really, you know, look at it. And, you know, um, I like those kind of moments where things kind of just come together or click or maybe the way, you know, um, the daylight kind of falls onto the work and it reacts with the colour or it reacts with the, the form of the work. Um, but this particular work was, uh, for me, it was really interesting. This was a show that I did for Bishop Weiss in 2010. And um, at the time I had a studio that the ceiling was really low and I couldn't put up most of the work in the studio to check if they, um, if the geometry lined up, if the color worked, all of this kind of stuff until it went up in the gallery. And the gallery had quite high ceilings, so I, I really wanted to kind of play with the height. So this work, when I initially put it up in, in the gallery, I had a bit of a panic because, um, as I was saying earlier, I don't really mix paint. I don't. Um, and one of the reason is that it's not something that comes naturally to me, mixing paint and coming up with kind of these kind of pure colors, if you like. So I really like working with kind of ready-made materials and ready-made colors um, and kind of straight out from the tin or straight out from the spray can, if you like, in this case. Um, and so when I put this work up, the central image is, um, is where you see the colors mixing. So I had, I panicked and I thought oh, this is a disaster and it's too late to take the work down, too late to do anything else. Um, and then I thought, actually, you know, I need to leave it. I need to kind of think about this. This has happened for a reason. And so I left it. And I think sometimes it's quite important to kind of acknowledge, you know, um, and accept kind of mistakes or accidents that happen within the work and, and see what you kind of, um, you know, where it takes you. Um, with this particular piece, um, the more I looked at it, the more excited I got. And I loved this kind of third layer that I was getting within the work. And um, I then kind of, been I've been ever since then I'm still making these work I'm still exploring this kind of interaction between color light and and geometry within within this series and I still get excited by this body of work um, I think it's something that um, it still has a kind of surprise element within the work so when you take the masking tape off and you put it on the wall um, the interaction you have with natural light is in incredible. Um, these are some of the watercolors. So I, um, you know, the last, I think I would say um, five, six years, um, I've struggled with um, st stress. I've struggled with depression. I've struggled with, um, being a single parent with two kids and managing a studio. Um, so I started kind of, you know, as the kids got older, I started thinking about residencies and as a way of um, not escape, but as a way of finding time to really focus on the work and to really think about the work a bit more and think about different aspects of the work. Um, and so I had an opportunity, obviously, with Tates and Ives to do a residency and then produce a body of work to show. Um, what I love about the residency is that, you know, there isn't a pressure to produce. Um, you could spend that time either reading or just sitting and thinking or just walking around and... Um, I had this incredible studio in Portsmouth Studios in St. Ives, um, which looked out into, um, into the sea. And I, I mean, there was just so much drama through, you know, that you could see that was visible through the window. And I wanted to kind of capture that drama. I wanted to capture the change of light. And I started taking these time-lapse videos, but it didn't feel enough. I didn't feel 
tangible. I wanted to be able to touch. I wanted to be able to feel. Um, so on the right hand side is um, some of the uh, watercolors that I started doing, and it was it was quite nerve wracking using a paintbrush and paint. Um, but I thought, you know what, it's it's okay. You know, I can only. Um, you know, I can only make mistakes, it's not a disaster. And I started thinking about layers, I started thinking about each stroke, I started thinking about kind of moments that I was seeing, moments of kind of lights that kind of being reflected in the water. And um, so all of those things I was trying to kind of capture within within the kind of paint. And the piece on the left is actually so because I've had such an amazing time doing these watercolors, um, I start I started now kind of traveling with watercolors and a small kind of A5 um, sketch pad and paintbrush. And I would do kind of watercolors, whatever kind of comes into my head or whatever feels right in the moment, I started doing watercolors. Um, these these for me feel like studies towards something that is much is going to become more physical more interactive or something that takes up the space if you like um and they have i mean the, this is a um a large uh, wall painting that i did for um uh, a, a group show at christia roberts and I have to be, I mean, it's probably something I should actually say, um, being an abstract kind of artist that loves geometry and color and form, you know, there is a, a danger that you could kind of fall into different, um, you know, I mean, I was trying really hard not to be pigeonholed. I was trying really hard not to, be restricted. I did, you know, painting for my BA and MA because I felt both of the subjects um, and both of the disciplines had the most kind of um, freedom within within the course for me to kind of explore whatever medium I wanted to, um, and and I wanted to kind of continue that kind of way of working even after university. And I was really careful not to be pigeonholed into becoming um, categorized as um, either Muslim, female, you know, Islamic art, you know, kind of that kind of thing. I was really, or, or in crafts. Um, not that there's anything wrong with it, but I, I I love all of those aspects. I love the fact that being an artist, you can draw from all these different disciplines. I mean, I think this was what was so eye-opening about doing a foundation course. Um, was that I, I never knew that all of this kind of existed. You know, I had a quite a strict upbringing um, and quite a strict Muslim upbringing. You know, so I prayed five times a day. I read the Quran. And I loved all of that. And I think all of this has and does come through in my work in some way or form, but it, I didn't want it to be about my own kind of personal experience. I wanted to use a language that was much more universal that people, that anyone could connect to. And, um, and yeah. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to continue. Um, these are some of the other paintings that I'm exploring. I These are kind of, in the studio, they're called kind of Osprey paintings. And the reason they're called that is because uh, those bar paintings or any spraying that we have to do, before we spray, we have to test each can for consistency, flow, um, and the color to check, make sure that it matches. And each time we were spraying and testing the can, it was building up over months and months, you're building up this layers and it left this kind of narrative within the work. It left, um, it left a trace of, of the works that we've been pr um, producing in the studio. And I started feeling this kind of connection with these works and, and then started working on them on top as well. So these works have now become kind of sculptural pieces um, as well. This is actually uh, an image from my residency um, in 
um, Portsmouth Studios. And these were kind of floats that I got. Um, so below my studio, there were a few studios for fishermen and they were incredibly nice. I used to love going in there. I used to love um, looking at what they were doing, how they were working with the fishing net and the floats. And when the fishing net used to get stretched out across the, um, the room, uh, they had windows and the light would come through and there'd just be this kind of beautiful um, kind of geometry in space. And I started, um, I was given kind of the fishing net and the floats. I started taking, I started separating these two materials. And the minute I started separating these two materials, um, I just loved, I, I loved this kind of form. I loved, I, you know, I never really appreciated curves before. And it was something that I really, again, another thing that I kind of struggled with. Um, but when I started putting these shapes down onto the table and the way the light was kind of falling on them, it was just so beautiful. And I had this moment where I really connected with Barbara Hepworth work. I've, I've grew up learning about Barbara Hepworth's work, but never really appreciated it until then. Um, and so these works were, were kind of completely stripped of color. And um, I wanted to kind of just focus on light and form. Um, and then this is, um, Again, you know, um, I started getting a bit more confident with color and paint and I wanted to kind of explore what was happening with the bar pieces and how the colors were interacting with each other. And this is um, kind of where I started kind of lay layering color and you get this kind of beautiful kind of third layer of color. Um, and then these are another series of work that I'm exploring where um, there are moments in the studio that I want to kind, I, I want a complete break from hard edge geometry, but um, not completely. So these are on the left hand side, you see an image of A4 pieces of paper that are kind of folded up into grid, then unfolded and scrunched up and folded again and sprayed to create this kind of undulation, or I'd like to say kind of organic geometry. And it's got this kind of beautiful otherworldly kind of landscape that I'm really excited about. And I don't know where it's going and and I feel that's okay. And I want to kind of see where that is gonna take me. And so the piece on the right is with jasmineite. Um, so I've started casting them in jasmineite. And the reason for that is that I didn't want to encase the work in frames. I wanted people to be able to kind of see those textures and the, and the geometry within the work. And this is a, a piece of work that also stems from um, the work I did at Tate St. Ives um, with fishing net. And this is kind of completely kind of coming out into the space as well. Um, I used to um, go fishing as a child in Bangladesh and I, I loved those kind of structures that you'd see. And so, you know, all of these kind of things, memories um, from my childhood kind of seeping into the work. I'm gonna go through fast because I feel like I'm taking up a lot of time. Um, so again, this is kind of, um, you know, pushing this material and this um, body of work to completely different scale as well and seeing where, where this will take me. Um, and this is a collaborative project that I worked with a musician um, called Haytal and it has light and sound. So it's the first time where I've used artificial light and it's, it's really, it was really exciting and nerve wracking at the same time. But I, you know, um, I love challenges more and more. I love um, collaborative um, processes and conversations. And I think they bring something into the work that, you know, that you don't necessarily have when you're kind of cooped up in the studio on your own. Um, and I think, for me, this kind, this kind of conversation really encourages and um, dialogue and encourages kind of, um, you know, 
of kind of pushing ideas, pushing things to the limits, if you like. Um, this is a project um, that I did at Kettle's Yard in the church. Um, this kind of stems from um, the work I did at DAS um, 2014 with baskets. And it's trying to kind of recreate experiences that I had as a child growing up in Bangladesh um, of light, sound um, and sound, um, where I used to read the Quran in the mosque and you'd have like the water fountain, you can hear it and you can hear everyone reciting the Quran and you'd have sunlight flooding into the room. And it was just kind of incredible feeling of joy and exhilaration and rhythm and repetition and it was just um really beautiful and it's still quite vivid in in my um in my mind and I was asked to kind of recreate that um, installation for the church at Kettle's Yard. And it was really lovely, actually. Um, I love this kind of connection, you know, I guess between kind of two religion, if you like. Uh, anyway, there's a lot of, a lot of conversation. Um, this is a work that stems from those paintings that I showed earlier, the MDF pieces where, um, you know, these, this body of work really explores um, and looks at color interaction and kind of the physical interaction, if you like, and also in some cases how the light um, allows the work to extend beyond the perimeter of the work, if you like. I'm kind of, I feel like I'm running out of time. This is uh, another series of work that I started exploring during my residency in the Philippines. This is a piece of work, sp site specific work that I produced for DAS uh, 2020. Um, and it's fingerprint. Again, it's an experience that I had in Bangladesh where my father had left some land and we had, you know, he'd donated some land. We. I said, you know, my siblings and I had to um, sign the land over, but it wasn't just enough to have signature. We had to also kind of go to the registry office and put our thumbprint in. And so these are kind of thumbprints um, all across the stairwell. And I, there was this kind of moment where you felt this incredible connection. So in the registry office, the entire wall was covered with people's kind of fingerprints um, that people kind of wiped off. And there's this wonderful connection between land and architecture. And I just felt so moved by the, that space that I wanted to kind of recreate that experience. Um, this was a collaborative project with Marina Tabassum and um, she's with, um, again, Geometry and Light and um, I loved collaborating with her and it was a project called um, Is This Tomorrow and it was really interesting to kind of think about the future, especially at a time, this was before COVID, um, where politically it's you know, it's been really intense and we've all been affected by it. Obviously what was going on in the US and, and Brexit, I felt like we were constantly living this kind of roller coaster and uh, Marina and I wanted to produce, well, create a space that kind of brought people together and created a calm contemplative space. This is a work that I recently showed in my solo show with Kate McGarry and, um, and this is coming out of lockdown and um, I, you know, pandemic, I, I felt like I wanted to create a show that, um, that reflected that the experience a little, little bit and reflected what we were all kind of feeling and, um, and needing this kind of lightness and calmness and, um, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm lost for words at the moment. But anyway, so this installation um, for me was, it was quite uplifting. As you come into the space, you see kind of um, a cloud of color floating in the space. And as you walk around, um, the forms kind of shift um, and mix, colors mix. Um, and these are some of the public art projects. I'm going to go through quite fast. This is a kind of interactive ins installation 
in Surbiton Health Centre where you can kind of, um, it's with Duplo Lego, which where you can take a part and either rebuild the pattern or uh, build something else. But I wanted to create something that allowed people to kind of connect with each other or forget why they were there or just to kind of, you know, um, I mean, I, I used to spend a lot of time in hospital because of my father. And so I found art to be incredibly helpful in those kind of situations, either to kind of have conversations or, or to kind of, you know, uh, allow you to kind of think about something else. So it was important for me to create something that was tactile. And this was at King's Cross, uh, it's no longer there. Um, again, it was a space that I, over the years have seen change and wanted to create something that was interactive that people can touch and and you know kind of run their fingers across the surface and see it change throughout the day or the evening this is in Westgate in Oxford and again you can see how the colors kind of uh, or the material reacts to the changing light this is um, the most recent project in uh, Juan Askens in Sweden. Um, on the right hand side, it's a permanent installation, a pathway. And again, that's kind of responding to the current um, situation and how we move through space. So I wanted to create kind of moments within the journey to the sculpture park where people can pause and take in their surrounding um, and and have these moments of kind of reflection if you like um, and this is in Folkestone um, as well for the biennial um, this was a really difficult project actually the budget was really tight and the beach huts were um, again off the shelf and so working with kind of limited budget and and material as well um, and the beach huts were kind of um, strand I guess we're in in various groups along the promenade and so I I wanted to do something that kind of one brought them all together or connected them somehow, um, but also create, you know, created movement and um, allowed people to kind of really experience movement in a, in a different way. I think this is the last image. I'm going to stop sharing. Brilliant. Thanks so, so much, Rana. That was um, a wonderful presentation. Uh, we, we, we now have time for um, some questions uh, for everyone. Um, so do please put questions in the chat, or no, not in the chat, in the Q&A box. We've got some turning up already, actually, which is wonderful. Um, but I'd like to ask each of the panellists a, a question to begin with, and maybe um, to uh, expand, really, I suppose, on, on various things that have been said in each of the presentations. Um, and that's really a, around the question of sort of cultural heritage, identity and race and how you see that, or if you do see that manifest in your artworks and if you do see it manifest in your artworks, what that sort of means for, your, for you and your practice. Um, maybe Haroon, could, would you like to, to start? Um, yeah, of course. I mean, I... Um been thinking about that question since you asked it. Um, so someone amazingly wrote an article about my work recently and what I found really wonderful about the article was he picked up on something which I wasn't really conscious of and I don't really articulate, which is that a lot or, or quite often work um, by a diaspora is very understandably and very reasonably so about deracination, about being pulled between two cultures or two places or a myriad of those things. And something you flagged up about my um, my recent work is, um, I guess it's more of a celebration of being split between different cultures. You know, the the panels in a way, um, the things that connects those things, British landscape painting, abstract expressionist modernism, rave culture and textiles is me. You know, is the fact that I, I have a Pakistani mother and English father, but and I have a, an affinity of Pakistan. I've been there, I spent a long time there, but I'm from Harringay. And so instead of being pulled apart, I found um, me and my, the kids I grew up with skateboarding, we were really all uh, quite multicultural. And it wasn't as if 
that was a cachet or a flag that we flew. It was just how we grew up. And I think a lot of kids from, like, I only know London, but a lot of the people I met from other metropolises feel the same, which is just it's the air you breathe. So I was going to come into this saying, like, no, not at all. I don't feel any connection with um, the abstract being to do with my status and heritage. But then actually I thought, no, that's really not true because my mum is a textile collector and she's from Pakistan and a lot of my references are from her collection. So annoyingly, it's a, it's a massive no. And yes, I feel, I feel an affinity with both those things. And also um, I'm, I'm sort of very intrigued or sort of interested that within your work, you also make sort of direct reference to what, what the South Asian modernist artists from the from the fifties and sixties who were showing in Britain in Britain, like, um, mm. uh, and that's a sort of direct connection which you're referring to, which I think is so fascinating. Thank you. Um, we, we'll move on because we're running out of time, and we want to have some questions from the fl from the floor as well. But um, Rez, would you like to reflect on that question? Yeah, it's, it's a difficult question to answer. I mean, for me. Um, and that was a great, great answer, Arun. I wish that was mine. <laughs> um, I mean, I was brought up in the, I suppose, the, the, the dark 70s, you know, um, where I went to school, we had um, National Front headquarters down the road and some of the kids from school used to recruit from there. Oh, yeah. A lot of the kids used to go packy bash in, in Brick Lane, because uh, the, the school's in Old Street um, you know, during lunchtime. And so race was, was there, you know, the idea of, of, of being different and being an outsider um, had always been there. Um, as far as um, my practice goes, um, yeah, that's, again, it's a very, very, very difficult question. But I think around that time, yeah, from, from you know, um, say my fifth, fifth, fifth form to all, maybe all the way to, to college, I was kind of aware of being different and being brown, um, coming from a Muslim background <clears throat> and people not wanting me there, kind of. Um, but at the same time, I think there was a, a point of denial as well where I was um, maybe, and maybe that's associating like religion with, with race. And, um, <clears throat> and so wanting to be part of the, the English culture and be part of um, the white culture, as, as it were. Um, and maybe that, that pushed me into, uh, or pushed myself into, you know, um, areas of arts or art practice that maybe if I was in a different country, you, you know, I, I might not have gone there necessarily, you know. Um, and even when I was starting, when I, when I was at Bath Academy, um, I think there was like, three people of colour in all, <laughs> at one time anyway. I think later on they had more people. Um, but whether that, how that influenced me, I think I, I just sort of carried on. I just had this idea of what I was going to be doing anyway. And maybe things changed when I went to India and I, all those kind of values and those ideas I had about, um, about race and culture, about Indian, going back to my roots. And I had certain assumptions about what, what I wanted to get out of being in India. Um, and that, you know, within a, a few weeks, that was just like thrown out the window um, and it was less of an issue for me. Anyway, so I'm just rambling. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Dan. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's um, th thank you for that, for, for that. Um, uh, Rana, would you like to expand on what you were, sa what you were saying? Well, I, I mean, I, re I agree with Haroon and Reza. Um, being brought up in two different cultures. I mean, you know, you could look at it in a negative way. You could look at the struggles that we faced kind of daily, you know, to get home and it, you know, you're kind of in a completely different world and you go to school and it's another world and, and it can mess you up. But I think what the three of us have in common is that we actually decided to look at it in a positive way. You know, we're very fortunate that we're able to have, um, you know, two different cultures and have this kind of, um, you know, this kind of positive energy and, you know, knowledge and, you know, it, that kind of seeps into our work and somehow it kind of comes out. I mean, the whole, you know, the racism, all of this, I mean, 
it makes me sad when I think about it and look back at it and how much, um, you know, we grew up just accepting it as, as just part of our journey, um, which I'm trying to really change that for my children. I, I don't want them to accept it as that. Um, and so that's been quite interesting having to kind of shift my attitude, you know, and actually hold people kind of um, for their action and, you know, behavior. So it's really fascinating in, in one hand, I think, you know, it's kind of toughened me up and it's given me a thicker skin to kind of exist and deal with the art world. Um, on the other hand, it's quite sad. Um, and it's sad that we had to kind of go through that. I mean, I don't know, Reza, it's been really interesting hearing you um, talk about the religious aspect, uh, the religious experience, the aspect within your work and that was something I really struggled with you know I prayed five times a day I used to love reading the Quran I loved that kind of spiritual aspect um, that I had growing up and it is in my work but you couldn't really talk about it because there was this risk of being pigeonholed there's a risk of you know oh you know your work has to kind of fit into that category because it can't exist in the contemporary abstract world because it has an element of kind of you know um I don't know religion in there so I don't know all of these things I don't I, I'm sorry I'm now trailing off <laughs> But that um, th thank you. I mean, we've got we've got a number of um, uh, questions coming in as well, and we um, I think we'll probably go on till about um, quarter past eight. Um, so the um, there are there are lots of questions, and um, some of them geared to individual artists, and some of them geared to to everyone. But maybe an interesting one to start with is. Uh, to to think, I think with all of your work, it was a question which was actually um, posed for Rana, but I think it applies to everyone, which is to do with um, the role that touch plays within the within the paint within the artworks that you've made, because there's a very physical nature to them, and it'd be interesting just to reflect for each of you a little bit on that on that tactile quality within the within the paintings, but with also within the installations um, that Rana's been making. Uh, Rana, would you like to begin? Um, for me, I, I became more and more aware of kind of the different senses, if you like. When um, kind of, when I was looking at like could sense, I could, you know, I would get these moments where you'd get goosebumps on your arms, you know, when light and form kind of um, react with each other. And I started thinking about, you know, the different kind of senses, sound, smell, um, you know, touch. And I think it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a big part of my work. It's not um, something that I kind of put aside and it only comes out. It's constantly there and it's, it really helps with creating the experience that I want the viewer to have with the work. Um, yeah. And Haroon, uh, yeah, I mean, I um, if you notice in my presentation, I, I made sure that every painting I've done recently has um, uh, shots from the side because, well, actually, just I describe them as painting slash carving slash relief sculpture because that's literally what they are. They're scratched into and then they're added onto, so that they, they aren't flat surfaces. And uh, years ago, my BA, um, an, an older artist, said something. It took me years to, to kind of really understand. And I'm not sure I fully have, but getting closer, which is he said, painting isn't just image making. And I didn't really understand that. And now I feel a little bit that I do in that, for, for me, I don't just want to make, um, it isn't just an image, like it has its resonance and it has a soul. And actually in acting, interacting with it in the space, it's got a lot more, um, there are energies there that I can't really understand, I can't really articulate, but they are tactile objects and I kind of, I in, of course don't want you to touch my paintings because of the fact that I'm trying to sell them, I'm trying to live off it, but I actually would like you to, you know, if, if in an ideal world, I'd love it if you could actually come and like kind of touch them or kiss them or hold them. And I think they are objects that I want you to feel 
um, drawn to not just visually, but kind of holistically. It, it, interesting. I mean, with the, the physical making of them, and you talked to also around the relationship to sort of fab to fabric mm -hmm. um, and um, Im imitating or not imitating, but kind of playing with that yeah. uh, within the within the surface. Uh, uh, Reza. Yeah, so I, I suppose, um, yeah, I'd, I'd gone down this particular path where um, I was treating the paintings themselves as objects, you know, painting the sides and doing things to the surface. And so I, I guess I, that's always been part of what I do anyway, um, whether when I was using wax, because sometimes I was just using my hands to paint with my fingers and even the, the paintings with the stripes, the, they're de deliberately like um, like finger size stripes to give the even the impression even if I'm not might not be using my fingers directly but the impression that that you could be doing these with your fingers and some of my early work um, actually is physically you know literally <laughs> you know chucking paint and um, using my fingers to, you know to make the images um, but for sure yeah there's always that sensuous thing about about using paints and and wax and stuff. <laughs> Um, and even when I was been doing like um, silver point drawing as well, um, sometimes I'd kind of scratch into. It's not really a scratchy process, um, um, but I, you know, sometimes I'd play with the gess gesso, scratch into the gesso, or um, build up layers of gesso, which which isn't really part of it. But um, <laughs> I can't help myself. Um, thank thank you. Um, we, we've got we've got an interesting um, question here from uh, Pauline de Souza, uh, which is uh, uh, for you. Well, it's sort of um, reflecting on your presentation, Haroon, which is was a reference to um, music and musical scores being um, not universal in a sense within the within your presentation, and a little reflection perhaps about the the coming together of, the, of music, I think is interesting. And then Pauline also goes on in another question talking about uh, um, many people, uh, well, to, for people to be aware that uh, people have many cultures, especially if they're mixed race. And so maybe we should try and move beyond talking about bi uh, uh, binary sort of uh, comings together. Um, but Haroon, would you like to reflect a little bit more on the, mu on the musical? And I yeah. don't know if that would affect others as well. Of course. I mean, the second part of that question, I just would say I agree. Don't really know how to expand on that. But the first part, um, in terms of it not being universal, I, I assume she means that she didn't grow up with it. And of course, like, that's a very specific subculture. So that would be my answer to that. But actually, the thing about electronic music that I, I, I'm going to paraphrase very, very badly, but someone once said, or I read, someone I'm very educated saying something about um, techno, particularly being very egalitarian, and like kind of lending itself towards um, this is a sticky term nowadays but like the liberal left because there isn't um it doesn't really guide you like it's 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 a very i mean a friend of mine lucas we, we're talking about the fact that a lot of people who don't really know much of techno they just think of like what my dad would call just like bang bang music but actually techno has a real spiritual side to it and a lot of it is very like um very meditative you know so so it might not be universal in terms of that you didn't grow up with it but if you listen to it uh, with an open mind i would be I would say a lot of people who wouldn't necessarily have um, feel they would have an affinity with techno, if they sat down and listened to a lot of it, they'd realize a lot of it is soundscape and, and a lot more uh, soft and gentle than, than the straight up like nosebleed dance music. So I think it is actually a very universal music. It's just you might not have had access to it growing up in the way that I did. Um, I also want to talk very quickly, if you don't mind, just briefly, someone's asked a question here about uh, how important is research and the history of non-Western Asian abstract non-narrative art, and is there such a thing? It's a massive question and a massive answer, but I will say one thing. About two or three years ago, maybe longer, there was a show called Garden and Cosmos at the British Museum, and it was paintings um, from Jaipur, I think, um, 1800s and earlier. And I would posit, as far as I know, I think I saw, I think in that show was, at least intentionally, the world's first abstract painting was from India because it had these three panels. And the first one was um, a sea of yellow waves and it had uh, some Hindu deities and some animals, some symbols. The next one had the same sea, but with less deities. And then the third one was just, I was mind blown. It was just a giant square of yellow. And I don't think anyone 
in the world yeah. was doing anything like that intentionally at that time. So I actually think to that question, I think as far as I know, the world's what the world's first intentionally abstract painting was from Jaipur. Uh, yes, I mean, I didn't, I didn't see that exhibition, but that's an amazing reflection. I mean, would would other people like to reflect on um, on that question, which was? Um, how important is research into the history of non-Western Asian abstract art or, no, or non-narrative um, art um, it, it's sort of impo important for you? Um, maybe Reza first. Um, I'm not sure how to answer that question, actually, uh, to be honest. So I'd, I'd, can I just pass on that one? Yes. <laughs> I think you, you, talked, you talked about it a little, Reza, in terms of like, you know, some of the artists that you were influenced by. And I think it is really important for us and it's important for us to kind of feel part of that um, history, if you like, as well. Um, and, and actually look back and see where, uh, in a way, when you're looking, when you're asking questions about yourself and your identity, you want to find where it kind of all comes from. So I think for me, it was really important. I, and I was looking at kind of Islamic art and architecture without really, um, you know, without really kind of making it, you know, as, uh, as obvious, if you like, but it, it was there. I mean, I, I traveled around Spain a little bit and wanted to kind of explore Islamic art and architecture um, in, in Spain and that made a massive difference to my work and it really kind of opened my eyes out. So I think, yeah, it's, it's really important to do that and continue to do that whatever stage you are in your career or life, yeah. Yeah, I think maybe, you know, subconsciously one picks up and absorbs stuff as, yeah. you, as you go along, as you, you know, travel through life. Um, and sometimes it might just be something um that you, you might have seen like years and years ago but without necessarily looking for yeah. it um you know, but also speaking. hearing you talk Reza I feel like you're you're constantly searching you're constantly asking questions and you're not just asking questions about now or about the current situation but you're also looking back as well and this yes is yes I suppose it's just articulating those sorts of ideas really yeah. I just feel like I know. I'm, I'm terrible. I, I really struggle with that. And that, I mean, hence why, well, I see myself as a visual artist. You know, I use a language that um, doesn't necessarily use words. And I mean, I, I really, really struggle with words. So for me, the way I express myself, I mean, I don't know if that's the right way, but really what I want to say is through the work. And if someone is moved by it in whatever way, whether it's negative or positive, then it's a reaction. You're getting something from the work. So yeah, we don't have to use words. <laughs> um, it's useful sometimes. Yeah, maybe, it is. I know, but I'm I'm happy not to. <laughs> maybe to to follow on from that question around um, sort of the research of. Um, non-western non -Western art is um, a question from uh, from Maria where, where she talks about uh, where she says can you please comment on the impact of Islamophobia on your work has that impacted on the aesthetic um, I don't know if that would be um, uh, you know how, how you how you'd, you would want to respond but it'd be interesting to hear well certainly Islamophobia in general I think, um, let me talk in general terms. I, I'm not sure if I can actually sort of connect it with, with art and my art practice, but, but I'll start talking and see what happens, see where it gets me. Um, but I think, you know, certainly uh, over the last few years, especially, you know, you know after 9-11, especially, you know, I, but the things I, I, let me just say, I've always felt like an outsider anyway. I've always been an outsider and even being a practicing Muslim now at this time, you know, I, I don't think I've ever really fitted in, even thinking I had, looking back from school to college, after college, you know, coming back from India. I think I've always been 
an outsider in, in, in some way or another. And, and even with, with my family, my, with my, my wife is English. My, my children don't, they only, they only speak English. <laughs> we only speak English with each other, apart from, you know, we speak, they know a few swear words in Mauritian maybe, <laughs> in Creole. Um, but we're all aware of Islamophobia. You know, I, both my daughter and my wife wear uh, hijabis. Um, and we go to the, I go to the mosque and, um, and where, where I am, it's actually, actually feels quite safe where I am. Um, I, you know, living in Stoke, <laughs> living in Hackney, in the Hackney, obviously a big mosque. Um, and I guess I'm, I'm in a sort of bubble anyway. And um, as far as my art practice, not, I don't think so, it hasn't really impacted me in any way. I, I think I just do what I'm going to do anyway. You know, even if it was, a, it, even if it wasn't Islamophobia, if it was some other thing, um, I, I will just, I'll just, I think I'll just carry on regardless, you know, whatever my, and I'm happy to voice my opinions of <laughs> whatever it is. So I think, yeah. Thank you. Uh, would anyone else like to? Um... I think Rez has yeah. kind of said it for us. I think we we are affected by it massively, you know, our day to day life. But at the same time, I think, you know, we're kind of determined to kind of continue um, the path that our work takes us. And sometime I think you know, I'm glad that um, I can actually feel more confident about saying the influences that, you know, the, the work, um, you know, has um, or um, gets, you know, inspiration from. So I, I don't, yeah, it's a really difficult one because I think we're all affected, our personal life is affected and whatever happens in our personal life, it somehow seeps into the work and um, and it usually makes you kind of, you know, how they say, whatever it doesn't kill you, makes you stronger. So um, I feel like it's made me more kind of determined and um, and be firmer in what I'm doing. Going to add to that, yeah, I, I can't answer, I don't think any of us can maybe answer that very specifically, but yeah, having um, experienced racism and having to build up a thick skin just makes you stronger. And um, the kids I grew up with were always to skateboard, and that's something that um, I brought into sort of my adult and artistic life also, which is just getting up and doing it again, even if you fall over and hurt yourself. And the same thing with, um, with uh, being the victim of racism. It's like, yeah, I can't tell you how it's affected my work specifically but I'm sure as a general kind of catch-all FU quality something of my person probably comes from that yeah thank you um all for those answers we've got a, a number a lot of other questions which have come through and um there won't be time to answer them all but there's um an interesting there, there are a number which which are talking about the 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 um, the complexity of, of identity and the complexity of um, experience really and about how that's captured in in work um, which is which is abstract and I suppose it, it goes back to a, another question which was raised which was around around your relationship as it were to figurative work and um, someone mentions the Hayward Gallery exhibition, uh, um, which is on at the moment, mixed it up, and which is of, uh, of figurative art, which some of you might have seen. Um, but maybe you could reflect a little bit on uh, contemporary painting and its relationship to figurative painting and, and narrative. I mean, clearly you're all working in a very different way, but just to um, reflect on that. Um, Haroon, would you like to start? I, I think that question, um... Like, as I never, I mean, individually, the artists in that show are all, all amazing and they make amazing work. So I don't want to comment on, obviously, them. I'm really supportive of anyone making art. Um, I just think it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a human societal issue. It's not really to the art world. It's just a fashion thing. So when I was uh, doing my MFA at Goldsmiths, graduated in 2010, there was a big um, focus on what they call zombie formalism, which is now, like, if you did that now, people would, like, no one does that anymore. 
But at the moment, if you did at that time, if you did figurative painting, it, you weren't even allowed in the room. So I just think it's like what's right now, the curators and just people are focused on a certain thing. Five years, they won't be. So that's why it's there's a preponderance of figuration in that in that show. And I wouldn't be surprised if in 10 years time, the Hayward did a solo painting and it was mainly not figurative painting. Uh, right, right. Um, uh, I, and do you, uh, um, yeah, and Re Razor, would you like to 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 comment? Yeah, I, I haven't seen the exhibition for a start, but um, just again, sort of general terms. I'm like, for me, I, I don't see much. It's not I don't see any difference. I, I'm just I just don't do big progressive work. Um, but I personally, I love seeing progressive work, um, and you know, I have no kind of issues I, I suppose it's a this kind of um it's, it's an odd thing like from maybe it, so, sometimes when we talk about abstraction or abstract art sometimes it sounds so antiquated <laughs> you know it reminds me of like um like a, a kind of post-war abstract <laughs> abstraction versus figurative and i've never really seen myself as part of that kind of discussion that, that discourse um yeah, you know, for a long time I had sort of slipped in and out of figuration to non-figurative work, but there were reasons, uh, you know, very early on why I wasn't a, a, a figurative artist. But at, at the moment, I, I kind of feel kind of out the loop, so I can't really talk about um, the sort of contemporary art scene as such. Um, not really being part of it at the, at the moment. Um, Certainly, in the eighties, I remember that you know the bit, there was a, a new spirit in painting exhibition, and it, you know followed by a whole load of other um, exhibitions at the at the Tate, um, you know, showcasing kind of new figurative work, which in in a way had a foot in conceptual art. But some of it had you know foot in conceptual art anyway, um, and a lot of it I love. You know, I, I love seeing Julian Schnabel's work. I love seeing you know. It, whole load of people I, I don't know I could just sort of list people um but I for me the, the that kind of it's, it's like almost like a kind of false dichotomy between um figuration and abstraction um yes I suppose it's also I was thinking with respect to um the, the complexity of narratives which which has come out I suppose through the discussion uh this um, this uh, this evening, uh, the the complexity of references, the complexity of um, uh, of sort of feeling and emotion uh, within within e e every everyone's practice, um, which has been so sort of enriching. Uh, um, Rana, would you like to say anything with respect to this? We're just I think we're more or less. Uh, at our closing moments um, uh, um well i think karun and reza covered it most i mean for me um it's quite funny i i used to assist um tess Jurey for about five years and she's also an abstract painter and we'd sit and have conversations with like oh you know when is abstract art gonna come into fashion you know when are we gonna have some attention but i don't know i mean i don't I don't make work to, and I, I don't think, you know, Haroon and Reza, you know, none of us, you know, if you look at our work, our body of work, you really see a journey, you really see this kind of depth within the work and the, the thought process that's gone into it. And I think, I mean, I don't know if I'm trailing off the subject a bit, but I guess, you know, it kind of comes and goes fashion and what is in trend at the moment. But I I come from that kind of background, you know, figurative art. I love it. I love, you know, looking at figurative art and I'm inspired by it. And so I feel it can kind of coexist all these different kind of disciplines and process and, um, you know, theme um, and narrative can coexist and it kind of all feeds off each other. And I think that's what's really exciting. You know, there is a moment, there is an excitement about painting, whether it's figurative, figurative or um, abstract. I think that's what I want to be kind of 
focusing on and looking at and not saying there's a competition between figurative and abstract painters. Um, that well, that sounds a good, a good, a good, um, good words to be ending with. <laughs> that there's not not necessarily a competition, <laughs> but um, competitive uh, competitiveness is is not bad. Haroon <laughs> and Reza. Um, We've um, overshot by 20 minutes and we shouldn't have done that. So, um, but it, the, the reason we did was because the, your talks and um, presentations were so fascinating and the questions so rich at the end and your answers so rich. So I'd really like to thank you all very, very much indeed for your time and for your work, your artworks, of course, um, but for coming and pr presenting. Um, I'd like to thank um, uh, Raksha, obviously, um, who uh, leads this um, project um, uh, with, with myself, and also to Lynn, who has helped facilitate um, the um, online event, as well as the um, team at CCW, the public programs team. Um, we will record this event or have recorded this event and we'll put it up online. And um, I'd like to thank all the uh, people who come and uh, participated through their questions and through listening and um, to thank them very much. And we will um, be running another event shortly. Uh, we're not quite sure when, but um, in the next academic year. So thank you all very much indeed. And I think we've all sort of learned a lot, but also can reflect a lot on what, um, well, on the richness of abstract work, but also the complexity of it and the large number of sort of different references from, from art, from culture, from life, from emotion that sort of run through each of these artists' works. So I'd like to thank them all very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and good, good night, everybody. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you for having Thank us. You. Bye. Bye. Take care, everyone.